All right, so I'm, I'm continuing my little series I've been doing for the past few weeks. And what we've been covering is what I call Christian cults, right? So there's, there's organizations out there that call themselves Christian, but they're, they're really cults. And, you know, a few weeks ago I gave what I, what my definition of a cult, because it's really hard to actually pin down, nail down a real solid definition. And um, I gave a lot of characteristics of cults, cults that use, um, you know, they, there's a person who usually claims to have divine uh, revelations, you know, with an with a angel or directly with God or things like that. But with these cults, what they do is, is they're not speaking to God. They're usually hearing from a devil or some satanic influence. I believe that a lot of these people probably are having some weird communications going on, but it's definitely not with God. And one of the ways that we know that this is true is because what they're teaching is contradictory to Scripture. It's contradictory to what's already been accepted. It's contradictory to what the Bible says. So um, there's typically a charismatic type of leader involved in cults, you know, people that are drawing people away, and it becomes more about the person than it does about, you know, the truth. And there's many, I'm not going to re-preach everything. You could listen a few weeks ago, um, trying to remember what the name is. It doesn't matter. You, you could go back and find it. It's the first one I did in this series, and I really went in depth on, on what we consider to be a cult. So what I'm going to be preaching on, I'm going to be doing more tonight going in depth on this, is the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Now, they were originally, and I'm going to go into all the history tonight, how they were originally called Adventist, and, and all the meanings of that. But this morning, what I'm going to be focusing on, what we'll be teaching on, is just the concept of the Sabbath. The teaching on what the Sabbath day is, what does it represent, should we be obeying it today? Because there are many Seventh-day Adventists, and you know, I try to be as fair as possible and, and, and truthful you know, about, about things. I don't want to just um, portray, mis, mischaracterize people or beliefs or anything like that. And there are Seventh-day Adventists that reject the teachings of their, of their founders, of Ellen White and things like that. And then you ask yourself, well, why are you still... Why are you still a Seventh-day Adventist? You know, if, you, if you reject these people who formed this cult, who started this religion, and you, and you already aren't you know, listening to that, and the main reason is because of this Sabbath thing, this Sabbath observance. And that's one of the main things that kind of keeps them involved. Now, they have a false gospel. There's a lot of things that they do that, that aren't right. And I'm, like I said, I'm going to go into that all tonight. So if you're interested in that, come back tonight. We'll be, I'll be preaching all through the various doctrines and things that they teach and, and you know, all the things that, that, are, that are major problems and why I'm even calling them out. But what I want to teach this morning just from the scripture is how should we observe the Sabbath? Should we observe the Sabbath? When is the Sabbath? What is the Sabbath? And, and kind of go through this from scripture. Um, and I'll make this, I'm going to say it again tonight. The purpose, the purpose of covering this material, one, the Sabbath, it's important doctrine, we just need to know. But two, when, we, when, I, when I call out you know, these Christian cults and stuff, it's not because we hate the people. We actually love the people. We want to reach the people. I want you to be best equipped to be able to reach the people, to be able to show them the truth, show them where they're in error, and just, just get them saved. That's the point. It's not to, to make ourselves to seem, oh, we're so smart and you guys don't know anything and you're so stupid, ha, 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 make fun of them. That's not the point. The point is to, to one, we love the Bible, we care what God's word says, and we care about the people that are, that are sucked into this thing, that, that are sincere, that are honest. I mean, even the Apostle Paul, right, he was a Pharisee. And the reason why he was able to find mercy is because he did it ignorantly. He said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He was sincere in his false belief in that Judaism religion where he, you know, that rejected Christ, that they, they, they were relying on the law of Moses for their salvation. They thought they had to earn their way into heaven. And he was sincere in that belief. But when he finally understood the truth, understood the gospel and got saved, you know, he rejected all that. But there are people out there. There are other people that are similar to Apostle Paul that are sincere in their belief. They've been duped. They've been lied to. You know, they're, they're involved in false religion. But we want to reach those people because they can be reached. You know, they're not all just evil people all trying to, to you know, to fight against you and fight against God. 
many people are just wrapped up into something because they've been tricked or they've been brought up in it their whole life or whatever, right? So we wanna reach those people. That's the goal. That's the spirit here when, when we're going through all these various uh, topics. So let's look at this. We're, we, we start off in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, of course, very famously contains the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses by God, by the, the finger of God written, you know, wrote these Ten Commandments on stone and carved in stone. Very important. You know, this is something that most people, even if they're not Christian, have heard of the Ten Commandments. Um, and where we stand as a church and our belief with the, comparing the Old Testament to the New Testament is that, you know, just because we're in the New Testament doesn't mean we throw away the whole Old Testament. God's word still stands, but we have to understand there have been some changes made to the law. And the Bible says because when the priesthood changed from the, the priesthood that was under the order of Aaron, so God ordained that, that Aaron's lineage was going to be the, the Levitical priesthood, and these rules were, were uh, implemented and given to, for, uh, for this time, for a certain period of time, until Jesus Christ came, who the Bible says was of the order of Melchizedek. He became the high priest, and that priesthood was done away with. So there's many aspects of God's law that were done away, not because... Um, they were bad or wrong or anything like that, but because they were fulfilled. And we'll get into this near the end of the sermon. I'm going I'm to prove it to you from Scripture that there is fulfilling of the law. You know, the Bible says that there shall not one jot or one tittle fail from the law till all be fulfilled. So the, the, there's, a, there's a purpose behind these laws. God not only is giving us uh, good wisdom with many of his laws, but he's also trying to teach us spiritual concepts that are associated with these laws. For example, you know, we don't sacrifice lambs physically anymore today. Of course we don't, right? That would be blasphemous to do so. Why? Because when they did that in the Old Testament, when they would bring the lamb sacrifice, when they would bring the Passover lamb, when they would bring their other sacrifices, they were shedding blood and, and offering up their burnt offerings all of it to represent and picture the Savior that was to come that was going to be the Lamb slain once for all from the foundation of the world, the, the, the Lamb that was to be slain and cover all of our sins. It was all representative. It was all a picture. It was all teaching and showing the Savior is going to come. But now since he came, we don't need that representation anymore. We don't need that picture anymore. That law has been done away. So there are other things, and I've done sermons in the past where I've gone through all of the differences between the Old Testament and New Testament. I'm not going to do that this morning because we're going to be focused just on this one, on the Sabbath. Is, is the Sabbath one of those things that has been fulfilled? And I believe it has, and I'm going to prove that to you this morning. So we're in Exodus chapter 20. We'll, we'll just start off right away with where was this instituted? Verse number 8 the Bible reads, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and held it. So what is the Sabbath day? The Sabbath just means the seventh day. And we get that pretty clearly when we read this passage. And it, and it relates the, the reason why there's the Sabbath day is because God created heaven, the earth, everything that exists. His creation took place over the course of six days. Now, this is also why we believe that creation that we read in Genesis chapter 1 literally took place in six literal days. That's why it says the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. We don't believe that, oh, when it says day there, it really means an age or it really means a thousand years or it really means, you know, to try to conform and fit the, cram the Bible into some worldly philosophy of evolution of science falsely so-called because that's a lie. We, we believe in literal creation. We, the, God wrote it. God said it. We believe it. This is the, God is not a liar. He's not trying to deceive us. When he says, the evening and the morning were the first day, and this is what I created, 
you know, and, and he created plants before he even created the sun. You know, I mean, this is the way he did it. And if you try to, if you try to cram this into evolutionary thinking, it doesn't work because you can't have one thing without the other going over, you know, a, a large period of time, right? Everything in, this, in, in God's creation is symbiotic. I mean, the, the, the plants need the sun to, to, you know, to get their energy and the, you know, the animals need the plants in order to feed from and it, it, all, it all works together. You cannot have reproduction. I mean, the, the plants need the insects and other things to do the cross-pollination and, and, and everything else required. You know, it, it all has to have happened quickly. And according to the Bible, it did in six literal days. So you can have a plant that doesn't have sunlight for a day and that's not a problem. Or two, right? I mean, it's not going to just die and wither because it's there for two days. It's fine. And God knew this, and that's God created things the way he did. So we see, one, the creation in six days, but then on the seventh day, God rested. He stopped working. All of his works, everything that he did, he completely he looked at it, and you know what? It was very good. What God had made was very good. So it's relating here, the, sa the Sabbath day is the seventh day. Now, one of the things that people might try to what, what, one of the false beliefs, and, and this is, it, it's, it's interesting because it's kind of like this, uh, this fight back and forth about the Sabbath day between two false beliefs. There's some people who believe that Sunday is the Sabbath day or the new Sabbath day and that, you know, other people say, well, no, the Sa Saturday is the Sabbath day. No, Saturday in our calendar is the Sabbath because Sunday is the first day of the week. Saturday is the seventh day of the week. So what is the Sabbath? It, it would fall according to our calendar on Saturday. Now, is our calendar the same as the calendar the Jews used? No. So do we know exactly what day, you know, if it's Saturday? You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just the seventh day. So when you have a week that has seven days in it, whatever the seventh day is, is the Sabbath. And that's all God's saying here to keep. Now, it is, yes, it is the Sabbath, and no, I don't believe that this needs to be observed today. There's some people who think we need to observe it, but it's changed to Sunday now, and Sunday is the new Sabbath, and, and you can't work on Sunday. I don't believe that either. I don't believe that you can't work on Sunday. Now, and the reason being is just because this, this commandment of the law has been fulfilled. Let's dig into this a little bit deeper. So we see here, let's look at how strict this is too, because this is actually very strict in what God is saying about the Sabbath and about no work being done. He says in verse 9, six days you could work. You could labor, do all of your work. You've got six whole days out of the week to do your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. He said, do no work. Not just you. He says, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, not even your animal, I mean, not even your cattle. You can't even send your animals out to work because no one is to be doing any work at all on the Sabbath day. He says, no one that works for you, no one that serves you, no, you know, nothing. So, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, not even, you know, other foreigners. He said, no one is to be doing work on the Sabbath day according to God's law in the nation of Israel that God has given as his commandment. Now, if we were to apply this today, because there's a lot of people who want to, or who believe that we still ought to obey the Sabbath. They incorrectly believe it, but that's what they believe. But I think oftentimes people who, who have this belief, one of the things that this has become, and, and one of the main problems I have with like Seventh-day Adventists and people who really cling to this, is also a big thing in the Hebrew roots movement, is they use this as like a sign of their spirituality and showing why they're so much better than you because I keep the Sabbath day, you don't keep the Sabbath day. You know, and they make this big deal out of, the, out of keeping the Sabbath day. It's like, kind of like the Jehovah's Witness say, you don't even know the name of God and you don't know what his name, you know, and they make this big deal out of this, trying to make themselves look so much more spiritual and righteous than you because of this one thing, right? But what's interesting is that when you look at God's command for keeping the Sabbath, there's like almost nothing that you should be doing at all. And when you think about putting other people, you know, not having your manservant or your maidservant work, most of us don't have people working for us directly as in showing up to our house, cleaning our house or things like that. But you do have people working for you in many other capacities that people in, in this time didn't have, especially if you think about your utilities, 
You think about other companies, you know, other way, you know, these are literally people, there are, there are people working out there serving you to provide you with electricity. There are people working out there serving you to provide you with your cable TV. There are people working out there serving you to provide you with whatever it is that you're getting. So if you really wanted to observe the Sabbath today, right, in, in, in our modern times, you wouldn't be able to use any of these things at all because you'd be making someone else work. You couldn't go out to eat. You couldn't go to restaurants, you know, nothing. Because someone else would be working and you would be causing that person to work. So if we are to keep this, you know, if you want to, to, to be sincere with God's word and if you believe that we should be practicing this, then you ought to practice it fully, right? Don't, you know, don't be a hypocrite about God's law. Say, no, if this is the way we ought to do it, then do it all the way through. And most of the people that want to just use this as something to lift themselves up with aren't following the Sabbath the way that God spells it out to be done. Turn, if you would, just a couple uh, pages to the right, Exodus chapter 31. Because this is, this, this was and is, this is a big deal for God, this commandment uh, of, of observing the Sabbath, observing the seventh day and taking that rest and not working. And we'll get, we're, we're going to try to wrap it, I'm trying to get ahead of myself why this is so important, but the, the, just the act of not working at all and resting from your works completely was a very, very, very important point that God is trying to drive home. And it's so important that he put the death penalty on breaking this commandment. So there are other commandments. And here it says, you know, in the 10 commandments, it says not to covet, right? Not to covet your neighbor's wife or his goods or anything that he has. But you know what? The, the law, God's law, does not have a, a, a penalty or a punishment, like physically from the, from the government, against covetousness. But it's part of the Ten Commandments. It's very serious, right? It's sin, and of course, all sin carries the punishment of hell. But as far as human government's concerned, covetousness was not punishable by any, you know, it wasn't a crime in the sense of, oh, you have to pay a fee or or anything like that. And there's many things in the Bible that are sin, but they weren't instituted as being law in the civil government. But breaking the Sabbath day was part of the civil government. If they caught you working on the Sabbath day, that person is to be put to death. We'll read that here in Scripture. Look at verse number 13 of Exodus 31. Verse number 13, the Bible says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people." Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout the ger their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, there are a few reasons why God instituted the Sabbath, but we see here he's very serious about it. If you, you know, I mean, think about a capital crime. I mean, there's, there's almost none of those in our society today. On paper, you may have some serial murder getting put, you know, getting the death penalty, but in reality, even the executions aren't taking place in the vast majority of cases. I just heard something that, and I didn't know this before, but I heard of a case where someone got the death penalty in Nevada, and now the way that Nevada works, to my understanding, I don't know if it's still this way, but from the, the documentary I was watching, they only put people to death if the person who was sentenced to death requests to be put to death. What kind of law is that? I mean, what, what kind of force is there to say, you are, you know, you've earned the death penalty, and I wonder how many people in that state even realize that. Think about, I mean, you know, you're not always following up with all the laws and, you know, and punishments and things like that, but if you were to have someone murdered in your family, right, murdered in cold blood, someone does this horrible thing, and you know what? You say, you know what? Judgment needs to come on this person. They deserve the death penalty. 
They go to court and the judge hands down the death penalty and that family's like, great, we got justice. No, you didn't because they're not actually going to put that person to death unless they say, yeah, put me to death. It's craziness, but I don't want to get off on a tangent. <laughs> I just found out about that this week and it kind of blew my mind that, they're, that they even would have such a thing because it's not the death penalty then. That's allowing suicide. <laughs> That's carrying out, you know, in, in that case, just saying, oh yeah, put me to death instead of, no, you deserve this. But um, flip over, if you would, to chapter 35 of Exodus, chapter 35. We see a little bit more clarification on, on you know, how strict this is. We already saw right when he gave the commandment, in the commandment that's written in stone, part of the Ten Commandments, that you can't be making anyone else work. You know, you can't um, work yourself. You can't even have your, your animals, your cattle. No one could be doing any work. We're going to see even more clarification on what you can and cannot do. Look at verse number one of Exodus 35. The Bible says, And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded that ye should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. So not only... Can you not do work? He said, you can't even start a fire. That is, I mean, if you want to talk about um, how much work, we just had a campfire in my, in my backyard yesterday. That's not very much work involved at all. I mean, you, you, I, I didn't even consider it to be work to put sticks in the fire pit and light it on fire. You know what I mean? But this is how serious God is about nothing being done on the Sabbath day. And there's even a story, I'll just read this for you in Numbers 15. There's a story of a man that was caught gathering sticks. That's all he was doing. He was outside on the Sabbath day gathering sticks, right? Probably sticks to kindle a fire with. But the Bible already said, you know, God said, don't even kindle a fire. Numbers 15, 32 says, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward, which means they kind of arrested him, right? They, they held him because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, the man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. God is serious about this commandment. Now, if we had to keep this commandment today, you can see how serious we ought to be about this. If you think that we ought to keep, I mean, this is one of those things, just as much as, you, know, you look at all of, the, uh, of God's laws that carry the weight of the death penalty. I mean, you ought to be serious about all those things, right? Now, most of those are things that you probably would never do anyways, right? Like, I mean, murdering someone, raping somebody. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's multiple things that, that carry the death penalty. But obviously, we treat those things as being very serious and very grievous. Well, this is the same thing. This is the way that God views obeying the Sabbath day. So you can't even pick up sticks. You can't even be gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. Nothing being done. And the reason why I'm kind of making such a big point of this is that these Hebrew Roots Movement people or Seventh-day Adventists, they are not being this strict with the Sabbath day, yet they want to hold that over your head as being, oh, you're not following the Sabbath day. And it would do them well. I mean, look, if you're sincerely wrong about something, be sincere about it at least. And look to Scripture if you're going to get your model on how we ought to observe the Sabbath day. Turn, if you would, to... Leviticus 23, I always want, since we're doing a teaching on the Sabbath, this sermon isn't just about you know, the, the, the cults or whatever that, that are using this, but um, I want to do a little bit extra teaching just on the word Sabbath and what it means. We saw it's already the seventh, it's the seventh day. There's a Sabbath that, that exists every week where you don't do any work to the Lord. But there are also days that are referred to as Sabbath days in the Bible that are not Saturdays, that are not just the seventh day of the week. There are, they are high days, they are holy days, but the same rules still apply to these other Sabbath days where you can't do any work, you can't gather sticks, you can't, you know, 
everything that, that is associated with the Sabbath day on, that would be a Saturday Sabbath day, also applies to other days of the week. Leviticus 23, look at verse number 23. Leviticus 23, 23 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So it says here that they're supposed to have this holy convocation. It's a Sabbath, and it's in the seventh month, the first day of the month. Now, as you all know, the, you know, the, the days of the week change. You know, the, 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 whatever month you're in, the first day of the month is not always the same day every year, right? Just like your birthday doesn't always fall. It's the same date, right? You have that birthday, but it's not always Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. So when they had these Sabbaths, they didn't always fall on a, you know, calling them a Sabbath doesn't mean that, oh, well, the first day of the month in the seventh month was always a Saturday. No. What it's saying is that no matter what day of the week, the first day of the month was in the seventh month, that is a Sabbath day to you. I mean, just like we have holidays, right? I mean, we celebrate Christmas and Independence Day and you know, all these various holidays where you get a day off of work. Well, whatever, you know, usually at least most people do, whatever day of the week that falls on, you don't have to work. So if it falls Monday through Friday, you normally would have to go to work. Oh, you don't have to work that day because it, you know, in a sense, like that's our, it's a Sabbath, right? You don't have to work. Um, but this is, obviously God is a lot more serious with his, but um, this is also called a Sabbath. There's a point. Let, jump down to verse number 31. We'll see another example of this in the same chapter. Verse 31, you shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest and ye shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Now I will say the one thing that the Seventh-day Adventists did seem to get right is that the, the Sabbath lasts from even to even, from the evening of the day before, you know, when the set sun set until the sunset of the next day. Is, that's the way that in the Bible they, um, they counted days, right? So the next day started. You know, we start our new day at midnight. You know, at 12 a.m. is when the new day starts. In Scripture, what they did is in, they had that just start a little bit earlier, about six hours earlier. So when the sun went down, that was the beginning of their new day. And uh, I mean, it's, it's not that big of a deal, but that's just that's the way that, that um, the days were counted back then, just to help you understand that. And that's why their Sabbaths would start when the sun went down and finish when the sun went down the next day. It's a full day. Uh, and then verse number 39 here, we have another example of a Sabbath that's not a Saturday. It says, also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. So there's multiple days that are called Sabbaths, not just Saturday, but primarily when we think about a Sabbath, it's the seventh day. There's these other holy days that are also considered Sabbath, and the same rules apply to them. Now let's look at the New Testament. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We see in the Old Testament that God cares tremendously about his words, about his laws, about people obeying and keeping his commandments to the full, to the letter, right? I mean, we saw the example of someone, hey, this guy was gathering sticks, and they, they said, well, we don't know what to do with them. They put him in ward, and then God said, yeah, he needs to be put to death. God made the judgment, okay? So we see the leeway that God has with these things and how serious he treats these things when it comes to obeying his law. However, people have a tendency still to skew and to misinterpret God's laws, the purpose for God's laws, and because of a lack of understanding of the law, they misapply God's laws. And this was part of the problem with the Pharisees in the New Testament. And this is important to understand because we do believe in God's laws. We ought to be meditating in God's laws. We ought to be caring about whether we're sinning or not. We know that we're saved by grace. It's not like we're worried about going to hell because we've sinned, but we do care about God's laws. We want to keep God's laws. We want to be pleasing unto God. 
We don't want to just live a sinful life. We want to respect God and his commandments and listen to his laws because we love him. So this teaching is actually really important so that we can have a proper good understanding and that we don't start to get a, a, a perverted attitude. And when I mean perverted, I mean like just a, you know, a, a misunderstanding or misconception of God's laws and misapplication of taking things too far like the Pharisees were doing in some cases where they want, you know, they, they were criticizing and condemning Jesus and his disciples for things that they weren't doing wrong to begin with. So Matthew 12 is an example of this. If you want to look at verse number one in Matthew 12, the Bible says, at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn and his disciples were in hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. So now they're calling him out. So but here's what's happening. Jesus and his disciples, they're walking around and preaching the gospel all the time. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're literally going out, ministering to people, reaching people, Jesus is healing people, and they're preaching the gospel. So it happens to be the Sabbath day. The disciples are hungry. Right? And there's nothing in the law that says you can't eat on the Sabbath day. Now, it does say and teach that you ought to be preparing your food in advance because, you know, you're not kindling fires, so you can't be cooking food and things like that. But they're literally walking through a cornfield as they're, as they're doing, you know, as they're ministering to people, as they're doing God's work. And they just pick off corn and start eating it. So the Pharisees are like, oh, you're breaking the Sabbath. What do you think you're doing? totally missing what the Sabbath is, what it's for, and how it's applied. They're misapplying the Sabbath day. That was not unlawful for them to take corn that was growing right there on the vine as they're walking by and eat it to sustain themselves to continue walking, right? To, 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 to keep going. And Jesus gives the example of what happened with David. He responds to them. Verse 3, it says, But he said unto them, have ye not read what David did when he was in hungred and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Now, when sacrifices were being made in the Old Testament, you know, it was the Levites' job to, to do all the sacrifices, and they were the ones that would eat of those sacrifices, depending on the sacrifice, right? Some of them were whole burnt offerings, but they were the ones that partake in it, but not everyone, depending on the sacrifice, would be partaking that. This was the showbread, which was put out before the altar of the Lord. And it was bread, and there was fires lit, you know, there, there was, you know, everything was put out before God. And what happened in this story with, with David was that they had to keep, you know, and in, in, in the course of the service, they would keep replenishing the bread, you know, daily. They would put new bread out there for the Lord. So what had happened was they already replaced it. So now they've got this, this bread that was the show bread out there. But it was holy. It was, you know, it's sanctified to God. So it's not something that, that was supposed to be eaten and consumed. He says, okay, for the priest to do that, but not, I mean, it wasn't just for everybody because it was this holy bread. But David showed up when he was fleeing from Saul, right? And because and, he left in a hurry. He didn't even have any weapons or anything with him. So he came in and, and you know, him and his men were hungry and he didn't have, you know, weapon and all this other stuff. So the priest gave him that showbread that, would, that had already been replaced and Jesus is now, when we read actions in the Bible, you can't always just assume that what people did was correct, right? I mean, people do, you know, there's things recorded in scripture that somebody did, but it may or may not be good or bad. For, for example, you know, there's people in the, in the Old Testament that had multiple wives. They practiced polygamy. Well, that's not, that's not good. They shouldn't have been doing those things because God says that for, you know, that a man shall leave uh, mother and father and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And it's, and it's you know, it's a, a singular between one man and one woman, just, just having that marriage. And man was not intended to have all these multitude of wives. And I could prove that from scripture too. That's a whole nother sermon. But just because people did that and they were men of God doesn't make it right. It was my point. So when David came and he ate the showbread, 
you know, that doesn't necessarily make it right. But when Jesus is sitting here rebuking the Pharisees and telling them, hey, don't you know what David did? And saying that this is what, you know, he's showing us very clearly without any doubt that there was nothing wrong with him doing that. Because he's using this as an example to justify what they're doing, to show, that, to show the Pharisees why what they're doing, there's nothing wrong with it. He says, um, verse 5, Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? What does he mean by that? Well, the priests would still offer sacrifices. They're still working. They're still doing their job. I mean, that they still were performing the daily sacrifices, the morning and the evening sacrifice. They were still working. And that's what he's saying. Don't you know that they're profaning the Sabbath? I mean, they're not working. I mean, they're, they're working and you're not supposed to be working, right? But they're blameless. Why? Because the law doesn't apply to that because that's not why God made that law. That's not the purpose of it. It's not the, the intent isn't just to shut down all work completely regardless of what it's for. So when they're serving God and doing the work of the Lord, that is not breaking the Sabbath the way that God gave the Sabbath. And when they ate this corn as they're walking through the field doing the work of God, they're not breaking the Sabbath because they're doing the work of the Lord. When the Levites offered up the sacrifice and partook of that sacrifice on the Sabbath day, you know, even though they profane the Sabbath in, in a sense, they were still blameless. They didn't do anything wrong. And then he says, I think he also says here, you know, it might not be in this, in this story, but in another one, you know, male children are supposed to be circumcised the eighth day after they were born. Right? That was the law. That's in the Mosaic law. Well, guess what? Some children, that eighth day is going to be on a Saturday. It's going to be on a Sabbath. So what do you do? Right? We, well, we're, we... The law says we need to circumcise on the eighth day. The law says not to work on, on, sa on the Sabbath. So what do we do? And according to Scripture, he says, you circumcise them. You keep them. You know, because because the, the point of this, it, it's, it's what is the meaning and the purpose behind that law? It's not to prevent God's work from being done. It's not to prevent people from getting healed or things like that. It's just to prevent your works, the work that you do, your labor, just, just doing um, your own work uh, you know, for your own benefit or whatever. Now, um, we'll keep reading here in this story. It says in verse number six, but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless for the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? So now they're, they're trying to trick Jesus and saying, Hey, is it, is it lawful? Can you heal people on the Sabbath days? Because they're thinking that you can't even heal somebody. They're taking that commandment of God too far and, and applying it in a way that it was never intended to be applied. And they just want to trick Jesus. So they're saying, oh, is it lawful to heal? And I, and I love Jesus' response to him. Look what it says in verse 11. It says, and he said unto them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. And again, very clear teaching from Jesus Christ that's saying, you know what, it is okay to do well. Even though it, you could consider it to be work, it's well, it's good to do well on the Sabbath days. There's nothing wrong with that. And he calls them out saying, look, you guys, if you have your ox or your sheep has fallen into a ditch on the Sabbath day, your property that you care about, you're going to go out there and you're going to help them out of that ditch, even if it's a Sabbath day. Because he knew their hearts. He knew what they're all about anyways. And he says, you'll do that. How much better is, is you know, a man than, than a piece of property than an animal? Right. Of course it's okay to help out someone who's sick and that, that needs to be healed. Verse 13 says, Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against them how they might destroy him. They were so wrapped up into their false religion that they were just willing to kill Jesus because... They thought it was so blasphemous for him to heal somebody on the Sabbath. 
without even recognizing their own hypocrisy of what they would do on the Sabbath day for someone else. But they, they had a holier-than-thou mentality. Uh, turn if you would to Mark chapter number 2. Mark chapter 2. I've got a lot of examples. I'm going to skip some of these. I'm going to try to pick out the ones that I think... Uh, Yeah, so, some of these are relatively redundant. I, went, I, I tried to get a lot of examples from the New Testament just to, to help convey the understanding of what the Sabbath meant and, and, and how it was supposed to be applied according to Jesus Christ. Uh, Mark chapter 2, look at verse number 23. The Bible says, And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. So it's a, sim a similar story. It's the same story, but... Uh, from, a, from, the, from the Gospel of Mark, we get some different information here. But as the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and was in hunger, he and they that were with him, how he went in the house of God in the days of Abiathar the priest and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him. Then he says in verse 27, We didn't get this from Matthew. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And that's an important statement to help us also have the understanding. God made Sabbath for man. You think about God rested on the seventh day. He did all that work of creating, you know, and we don't know how much work it really is for God to do these things because he was able to speak things into existence, but he's helping us understand, hey, I worked for these six days. I created this. It's very good. But then I rested on the seventh day. And he's saying, you know what? You work for six days, but then on the seventh day, you rest. And he created the Sabbath for man and not man for the Sabbath. You know, we weren't created just to, just to obey the Sabbath day, just to make sure that no one works. The Sabbath day was created for us. And actually, this statement's going to go even further. Um, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip. I'm going to skip some of these examples that I have here because I want to get into this. Uh, we need to get into this to, to, to wrapping this up. Because there's, so there's so many of these examples that make sense. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. When you understand what the Sabbath is representative of, that makes perfect sense. Now, turn if you would. Uh, I'm going to look at one more example here in the New Testament. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Now what's interesting, and I'm going to bring up this point because I'm not going to bring it up tonight, uh, just specifically about the Seventh-day Adventist. I was looking up on their website, you know, at Adventist.org. I mean, their official, I, I try to go to the official sites for these places so that I'm not just getting hearsay from other people or even hearing from people who, um, you know, might have been a part of this, but, but have some agenda or some other motive to not, um, you know, to, to say some bad things or bring up a bad report on the religion. So um, <clears throat> I went to their website, and one of the things that they say, when they talk about how they observe the Sabbath day, they advise those in medical professions to only treat people who have a medical emergency. Right, that's, it. that's all you're supposed to do is have a medical emergency. And um, one of the examples in Scripture, Jesus Christ healed this woman who had an infirmity of 18 years. Right? So for 18 years, she, she had this problem. And she came to Jesus on the Sabbath day and he healed her. And again, the Pharisees got all mad about this and stuff. But it's like, if you're going to make, as an organization, say, well, this is how we observe the Sabbath. You could only treat people if it's an emergency. Well, this woman that had a problem for 18 years wasn't an emergency. I mean, she, if she lived for 18 years with this problem, couldn't she have waited another day until, you know, the first day of the week instead of the Sabbath? If it was that important to observe the Sabbath in that regard, Jesus would have said, no, come back to me tomorrow because this isn't an emergency. I mean, you've had this for 18 years. But what did he do? No, he healed her. Right? So it's, it's, you know, again, it's just one of these things where they're, they're not even using Scripture to understand if you were to observe the Sabbath, like this is how you should do it. Jesus gave a perfect example right here of saying, look, it's fine to heal people. And it doesn't even have to be an emergency. If you're doing good, if you're doing right, if you're serving the Lord and, or helping people out like this, that's fine. That's not why <laughs> the Sabbath day was created at all. 
I had you turn to John chapter 5. Look at verse number 8. John 5, 8. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now this is really interesting because this is a Sabbath day and Jesus said to this man that he healed, rise, take up your bed and walk. And I think about it, on the Sabbath day, people were being put to death for gathering sticks. And he just told this man to take up his bed and walk. Jesus is not going to command anybody to sin. I mean, that should go without saying. We know this. So when Jesus is telling him this, he's not sinning. He's not telling this person to do anything wrong. And it's important to know that because we, on one hand, we, we always want to be very um, strict, in a sense, on God's commandments and understanding that, that, hey, God said this, he meant this, he's serious about this. In all of his commandments, we want to treat it very seriously. But at the same time, we want to make sure we get a proper understanding so that we know what is acceptable and what's not and why did God have these rules? Why did he apply it? It'll help us to know how it ought to be applied in every single situation and, you know, in, in every case. Um, so it says in verse 9 here, And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, Well, what man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. There was a lot of people around. He didn't even know it was Jesus. You know, he, Jesus just healed him pretty quick. He walked away, and that was that. He didn't know. Verse 14, Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Jesus said, I am working on the Sabbath day. And you know what? Jesus' work was all good, and still he was blameless. I mean, Jesus wasn't a sinner. Jesus was without sin. Yet he's saying he's working on the Sabbath day. The two have to be reconciled. So the work that Jesus was doing was exempt from being under the law of the Sabbath day of doing no work because he was doing good, because he was doing God's work. That's why. Um, and here's the reason why. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 4. I'm just going to jump straight to the end of this because Jesus was still talking about the Sabbath when he was walking around on this earth. The Sabbath was still in effect when Jesus was on this earth. He wasn't breaking the Sabbath by working because, you know, the Pharisees didn't understand what the Sabbath meant and why it was there and how to apply the law. It didn't apply to doing good, to helping people out, to healing, and to doing the work of God. It doesn't apply to that. That is, there's, there's never a day to not do God's work. But here's why we don't have to observe this today, because Jesus fulfilled this law. And we see this in Hebrews. And Hebrews is a great book. If you want to try to understand the differences between the Old Testament and New Testament, and what's changed, what things have stayed the same, read the book of Hebrews. And that's, you know, the, the whole book was written to the Hebrews, which are the physical descendants of Abraham, the Jews, right? That's who that book was, was directed to for them to understand. Believing Jews understand hey, this is the way we've been practicing. We've been doing sacrifices. We've been obeying these laws. We've been doing things this way. But no, Hebrews, things have changed, and here's what's changed. And the book spells out, and it gives the reasoning, most important, behind the changes. So Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse number 3. Jesus is our Sabbath, is what it boils down to. He is our Sabbath. Rest. What is the Sabbath? It's a day where no work is supposed to be done. How are we saved? We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is not of works. It's not our own deeds. It's not our own works. We cannot work to get to heaven. We need to enter into the rest of Jesus Christ. He did all the work for us. We can rest completely 
on him as our Savior without any works of our own. That is what the Sabbath day was really representing and teaching for us in the New Testament to understand, and for them in the Old Testament, but you know, they still had to follow his laws. Until Jesus came, he, became, he did all the work. He did all the work necessary and provided that rest for us. So we're going to read this in Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verse number 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief, again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And now, before I get any further, one of the things that this is bringing up is that the, the promised land that was promised to the children of Israel was also supposed to be a land of rest. It's supposed to be a place of rest. And God did not allow the children of Israel to enter into the promised land because of unbelief, because they didn't have their faith in God. They didn't believe they could win these battles. And he said, therefore, when God was angry with them, he said, You're good. this generation, you're going to walk around in the wilderness for 40 years until, until, you've, until that generation has passed away. Then they're going to be allowed into rest. So it brings up this concept of they weren't allowed to enter into that rest because of unbelief. And the application is the same way we can't enter into the rest of our salvation in Jesus Christ if we have unbelief, if we're not believing. You have to believe on Christ in order to enter into his rest, in order to receive the rest from your own works. You cease from your own works to be saved. You just have to say, I can't do it. You have to come to the realization and the point. Everybody does. Anyone who wants to go to heaven has to come to this point in their life where you realize, I'm not good enough. My works aren't going to cut it. I need a savior. I need someone to save me because I am not good. I cannot do it. My righteousness is like filthy rags in the eyes of the Holy Lord. Not good enough. But we can rest secure on Jesus because you know what? Jesus was good enough. Jesus was without sin. He did everything right. He didn't do anything wrong. And we could rest on the finished work that he did for us and rest completely in that. We're a church where I like to promote doing works. We like to go out and do works. We want to help people. We want to reach people. We want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to do works, but we're not trusting in those works to get us to heaven. We have a rest in our Savior. Hey, we want to be like Jesus and going out and working full time. Work, do the work of God and we'll be blameless you know, from the Sabbath or any other commandment when we're doing the work of God. But we're resting in Christ. And when Jesus came and died on that cross and offered us that rest, he fulfilled the law of the Sabbath day. It says in verse 10, For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, a piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, um, Two more scriptural references I want to give you just showing, besides this one, in Hebrews, Hebrews 4 provides the explanation of the Sabbath. It provides the explanation that Jesus is our rest. But we actually have explicit commands in the New Testament just stating that we don't have to regard the Sabbath anymore. In Colossians chapter number 2, as well as in Romans chapter 14. You could turn to these places if you like. Colossians 2, Romans 14 are both references. We have two witnesses here in the Word of God 
that are going to state that the Sabbath is not any longer to be observed in the New Testament the way that it was outlined in the Old Testament. It's not, it's not for us uh, today because it's been fulfilled, not because there's anything wrong with it, but it's just it's been fulfilled through Jesus Christ the same way the animal sacrifices have. Colossians 2, verse 16, the Bible says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. So it lists off things, meat, drink, holy day, new moon, and Sabbath days. These were all things that were part of the Old Testament law. All of these things were observed. The, the feasts, the New Testament, or I mean the, 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 the new moons, holy days, their dietary restrictions, all of these things were in the Old Testament. And he's saying right here, let no man judge you in any of these things. He says in verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So the, they had a purpose. They served their purpose. They were showing things to come. They were showing Jesus to come. But now that Jesus has come, they're no longer necessary. They're no longer needed. Romans 14, verse 4, the Bible reads, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. What we see in Romans 14, he's saying, look, you want to regard a day unto God? That's fine. If you want to dedicate a whole day of service to God, great. There's nothing wrong with that. Praise the Lord. But if someone else decides not to do that, I mean, they're serving God in their own ways, they're doing things, but they're not just like taking a day and making this a special day, he says, that's fine too. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Now, God doesn't give us this brevity. He doesn't give us this, this ability to just, oh, just whatever you want to do, do it, when it comes to his commandments and his laws. It's not optional. It's not just, well, apply this however you want to apply this when it comes to thou shalt not kill. Right? Well, you know, if you, if you feel like it or not, just, just if you're persuading your own mind. No. But in this case, he does. Where he's saying, you want to esteem a day? Great. You know, some people don't celebrate Christmas. That's fine. Other people do. That's fine. You want to esteem a day unto the Lord? Great. You don't want to esteem a particular day? Fine. There's no problem either way. And you apply this also to the Sabbath. We don't have to esteem a Sabbath to the Lord anymore. They used to, but now, hey, if you want to do it, fine. My last point um, I'm going to make, and this is kind of in, you know what, no, I'll just save this for tonight. We've already kind of exhausted this topic of the Sabbath. I'm going to, I'm going to show tonight why it doesn't really, and, and it's along these same lines, it doesn't really matter if, you meet, if your church meets on a Saturday, on a Sunday, on a Monday, on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, on a Thursday, you know, that's not what's important. We ought not to be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, as Hebrews 10 says, that we ought to be congregating together as a church. But the actual day that we meet on is inconsequential. The reason why we meet on a Sunday traditionally is just because we find examples in the New Testament of the disciples meeting on the first day of the week. One, it's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection of Christ happened on the first day of the week. So seems like a pretty good day to honor Jesus Christ, to, to worship Jesus Christ on the first day of the week, the day of his resurrection. It's one of the main reasons why we do it. We see other examples of, of in the New Testament, disciples meeting on the first day of the week. But you know what? It's not a law. There's nothing in the Bible that says you must meet on the first day of the week in order to be a church or, you know, nothing that says that. We meet on Wednesdays. There's nothing in the Bible that says anything about meeting on Wednesdays. Is that wrong? No. 
No, we're fully persuaded in our own mind. And if people want to meet on Saturday, fine. I don't care. You have church on Saturday. Great. Have church on Sunday, on Monday. And, you know, let's have church every day, right? It doesn't matter. The day doesn't matter. But, but you, we're, we're, it becomes a problem is when you start trying to force your opinion on other people to know you have to be having church on Saturday. You have to be, you know, no. That's not scriptural. That's not biblical. The Bible says you could esteem the day however you, know, however you see in your own mind. And that's fine. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us the rest in Jesus Christ that we don't have to rely on our own good works, our own good deeds in order to make it into heaven, but that we can fully trust in our Savior, Jesus, who shed his blood for us and, and paid for our sins when he died on that cross and rose again from the dead. Lord, we thank you so much for such a wonderful gift of salvation. We thank you for, for the assurance that we can have in, in knowing 100% for sure that we're saved and going to heaven because, because of our faith, because of what you did for us, dear Lord, and that has nothing to do with our own works of righteousness, dear God. But um, we thank you for that love. I pray that you please help us to teach that to other people. God, I pray that you would please just continue to open up our understanding and help us to reach people who may be wrapped up in some false religions and false doctrines. Help us to, uh, to meekly and humbly and, and treat these people and, and show people the, the, you know, maybe that where they're incorrect on Scripture. And God, I pray that you do the same thing for us. Show us where we're incorrect on things, Lord. I want to know. We want to serve you to the utmost and we want to be good examples unto you, dear Lord. Help us to understand these things about you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.